Welcome back. Again, my name is Sharla Marie Bailey, and I am your SPNN Forum host, and I'm sitting here with John Noltner, peace activist, photographer, and author. A recent book is Lessons on the Road to Peace. All right. John, welcome to the show. Thanks, Sharla Marie. Glad to be with you. Yes. So let's talk. You have this book that's coming out on October 24th. This book came out um, earlier this year, but we're okay. having an open house to celebrate it on October 24th. All right, and you'll be doing a book signing. Of course. And where will this be taking place? Uh, this is gonna happen right here at SPNN 550 Vandalia in St. Paul. Okay. 7 to 9 p.m. on the 24th. All right, awesome. And can you tell me more about yourself? We know that you're a photographer. We know that you're a peace activist and now author of four books. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, so I've, uh, I've spent my career as a freelance photographer. For a couple of decades, I photographed for national magazines and Fortune 500 companies and, and uh, travel companies. And about 15 years ago, um, two things happened in my life. The first is that uh, my soul was getting a little hungry. I was frustrated with the quality of our national dialogue mm -hmm. and all the things that ask us to uh, think about what separates us. And I wondered if there was something I could do with my photography and storytelling to instead remember what connects us. So that was going on about 2008. And the other thing that was happening in is, I, I like to say the economy handed me some free time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's the, a good way to put yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> right. The recession hit the world of freelance photography hard and fast. And my workload dropped quickly and dramatically. And I started doing this storytelling project called A Piece of My Mind, just really as a way to fill my time, uh, to keep uh, active in a creative sense, but also to connect with people uh, through this period that was frankly a little difficult for me to navigate as my workload was dropping. Um, so I started this storytelling project. It has since grown into my life's work. And so like you said, we've now got uh, four books and I've got five traveling exhibits that go around the country. And we try to use these stories to rediscover and sort of remind ourselves of the common humanity that we all share. Okay. Now, when you started doing photography, um, has it changed at all? Have you always taken the same type of photos mm. and they've grown in a, in a way that's geared toward peace? All right, what does that look like? Yeah, so always as I was photographing, I would, I would find myself you know, photographing pig farmers one day and musicians the next day and uh, people who were unhoused the day after that, um, all for stories that were assigned to me for newspapers and magazines. And, and an interesting thing happened in that process. I started really enjoying that rich variety of the people who I met. Like I would see the beauty and wisdom in a person who was unhoused as much as I would in a, in a clay sculptor, as much as I would in a, in a brain surgeon. And, and so as I started hearing some of this angry rhetoric in the world that was trying to uh, frame this division and talk about these people or those people, every time I heard that kind of rhetoric, I thought to myself, I know those people. Those are my friends. Those are folks I know. Mm -hmm. And that angry rhetoric never squared up with the human beings and the faces that I'd seen and met. And so, so over time, I think my photography has, has worked to be more intentional, to celebrate and highlight that beauty and wisdom that's in everybody. And, and I've tried to be really intentional to tell stories um, of healing and to tell stories of success, right? The world is filled with challenges and we all you know, could list them off at the drop of a hat. Um, and I think it's important that we address those challenges honestly and directly. But I also believe in my photography and my storytelling that there's a way that we can approach those challenges with a grace and a hope and a belief that something better is possible. And so as my work has evolved, I've really tried to be intentional about amplifying those voices of hope uh, and those stories that maybe can illuminate a better path forward for us. Yes, given a light. Yes, yeah. I can see that. And so now, 
I, I would assume that you've always been a peaceful person, <laughs> and that through <laughs> <Try>. your work, <laughs> and that through your work, because of the angry rhetoric that you heard, it just opened your eyes more to, um, in a way that you want to help others see people as people, as human beings. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. If you've ever gone out hunting for morel mushrooms in the spring or if you've, if you've been walking along a beach and looking for sand dollars, it can be hard to find the first one. Like you're not sure what you're looking for and it can be sort of elusive. But for me, if I'm walking on the beach and I see a sand dollar, I'm like, oh, that's what I'm chasing. And then it's easier to find the next one. All of a sudden you know how the, how the sunlight sort of reflects off of it. You know how it interrupts the, the flow of the waves as it's going by. So you start to recognize what you're looking for. And I think in the same way, when we're looking for ways to bridge divides, when we're looking for ways to reduce tension, or sort of uh, build community, you start to see these patterns. You start to see the ways that people have been wounded in the world, uh, the ways that our, our social fabric has been fractured or maybe frayed a little bit, and you start to recognize ways that you can maybe create some healing in that space. Not that you're gonna fix the bigger trends or the overarching systemic challenges that we face, but that you can make a human connection with people who are impacted, who've maybe had a different experience than you have, and, and find ways to build that human connection. And I think the more you do that, the more you recognize it, uh, and you can't really unsee it. You know, when you've, when you've recognized somebody's pain, it's hard to unsee that. And I think once we've seen it, uh, we need to acknowledge it, and once we've acknowledged it, we need to address it. And so as I travel through uh, the world, my eyes are continually open to new issues, right? I, I have my own personal life experience and it's different from a lot of other people. And so sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Right. And for me, it's a process of sitting down with people who have had different experiences, who come from different places and live different lives and being open to listening to that. Not so I can challenge it or correct it or anything, but just so I can hear it. Mm -hmm. And so I can start to understand it. And through that process, I start to open my eyes up to new possibilities and new connections. And for me, that's, that's exciting. You know, my journalistic journey, whether it's as a writer or a photographer, is that this is my way to explore the world. This is my way to understand things differently. So I find it exciting when I walk into a space and I'm not 100% familiar with how things work. And through the grace and goodness of other people who are willing to open up to me and share some of that. Um, not that I'm ever going to have the same experience of, you know, somebody who's been incarcerated, but I hope that I can have some human compassion. Yes. And if we have an exchange that I can start to extrapolate some of my experiences of feeling isolated or rejected or um, challenged in some way that I can, I can sort of extrapolate that with the story that I'm hearing and begin to get some sense of what that might, must be like as a human. That's, that's wonderful to hear. Hmm. And it's, it's encouraging as well because I've always wanted to travel, but I'm not versed in other languages. And so I, get, I become afraid that I'm gonna go somewhere and I'm not gonna be able to make it. Yeah. But there, there will be somebody there that's gonna be willing to help you out. To Boy, I, I have been blessed by the, the kindness of strangers and the generosity of, of others. You know, I was, I was just in New York and I, I love to tell this story uh, from a previous trip. My kids were little, we're on the subway, we're riding over to Brooklyn and we're going to a museum. And this was my first time in New York City. And I, I travel a lot, so I knew where I was going, but there was a guy standing next to me in the train. Mm -hmm. and. The guy had a lot of tattoos and a lot of piercings, and I felt like he was probably looking at me like, who's this suburban dad <laughs> hanging out next to me? But also maybe he's thinking, he probably is scared of me, right? Mm. Like there's this tension mm -hmm. that goes both ways that we mm. think we're being misunderstood. Or, and I could feel whatever that unspoken thing was, but I'm standing right next to him. So finally I, just, I pulled up my map and I leaned over to him and I said, hey, 
I'm trying to go to this place and I think it's this exit, but I've never been here before. Can you help me out? And it opened up this conversation and we, we laughed and we talked and uh, we got off the train and my kids said to me, Dad, you knew exactly where we were going. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but I wanted to have some little human exchange with this yes, guy. Yes. And I think we can do that wherever we go. You know, if I'm standing in the grocery uh, checkout lane, I can turn around to the guy behind me and go, oh man, that ice cream, that's my favorite ice cream. Isn't that great? Yes. Uh, and you just look for these opportunities where you can make a human connection. You can make eye contact. You can find a little something to share. And of course, not everybody wants that every day in every moment. And you can read the room mm -hmm. and you can know, okay, today's not the day for that. But more often than not, it opens a space. And instead of just standing there and looking at our phones or staring at our feet and waiting to get through, we can have a little human exchange. And I think that's beautiful and, it's, um, and it feeds me. You know, that's what, that's what gets me excited to go through my days. That's beautiful. And, and I was talking to you before about ways to spread peace. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and little gestures, nothing that's going to overwhelm any, anyone. And would you agree that this is a way to spread peace? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we go through our lives um, sort of skipping along the surface and we pass people um, and we don't make eye contact and we don't make connection and we sort of, we sort of drift through our days like that. And for me, when you make that human connection, there's a little spark, there's a little exchange of energy, and I think that feeds all of us. And I think if, if our experience of the world is what we see on television and what we are fed by the media, mm -hmm. um, it feels a little like we're doomed sometimes. Yeah. You know, it's discouraging. And I feel that same level of discouragement, but when I'm out in the world and when I'm having these exchanges with folks and when we connect, on that really human level, um, I think that gives us hope. And when there's hope, uh, there's peace. You know, when there's hope, there's there's the potential for connection. There's a potential that when we get when we, when we find ourselves in conflict, that we can also find a way through it. You know, I I love telling this story as well. When when my family moved into Bloomington, where we lived for a while. Um, I was unloading boxes in the garage and a new neighbor walked up and he said, you know, every first Friday of the month we have a block party and you should come. And I said, okay, but I didn't really give it the attention he wanted. Okay. He goes, no, no, you should make sure you come. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And he goes, I'll tell you why. He said, someday your kids are going to do something stupid. <laughs> probably, probably, that's fair. Yeah. I'm going to probably do something <laughs> stupid. But he said, you know, they're going to ride their bikes through my flower garden or they're going to accidentally throw a ball through my window. Mm. He said, stuff happens. He said, but when that happens, I don't want that to be the first time that I meet mm. you. You know, and I think that's powerful because mm -hmm. we, we all know there's going to be tension. There's going to be conflict. Stuff's going to happen. And if we don't have the foundation of a relationship at that point, we've got no no footing to start looking for a solution. But if we've, if we've invested the time to build that foundation of a relationship, when difficult things happen, we've got the tools at our disposal to be able to manage them. And I think the same thing is true with a neighbor in Bloomington, as is true with two nations, as is true with a couple of different um, you know, interfaith groups. If, you, if we don't have a relationship established, when things get difficult, it's probably gonna it's probably gonna get worse than it needs to be. But if we have that foundation of a relationship, if we've built a connection, we've got some place to start and we know we know that we can probably find a path forward together. Yes, that's wonderful. I mean, thank you for that because that's something that I can share with someone else as well. These are things that I do on a regular, I try to make a connection with people, right. be it at the grocery store or in passing down the street. Um, because when people have said something to me, you know, oh, nice dress or something, oh, I like your hair, it lifts me up a bit, you know what I'm saying? And then I pay it for it and, and this, that's just who I am. And I became that person when I was working in HR and there was this woman that I was working with, it was pleasant all the time. 
-hmm. no matter what time of the day it was. And that just wasn't me. And she rubbed off on me. <laughs> and so I started smiling more and greeting more people. And, you know, it was like her peace became a piece of my peace. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and that's beautiful. So, and I think the same way that anger and contention and, and, and division is contagious, right? You sit around that long enough and that will spread and it will rub off on you. But also the good stuff does. Yes. So if you become that person who can create that little bit of peace, can create that positive space, can create that positive energy, that also is contagious and that rubs off. I have a friend in Minneapolis, he's a spoken word artist, Joe Davis. Do you I know, know Joe? Joe? I know Joe Everybody Davis. Everybody knows Joe. Uh, hi, um, I'm gonna address the camera here for a second. My name is Charlotte Marie Bailey and I am your host today with SPN Inform. We are talking with Joe Noltner. John Noltner, sorry, because I'm thinking of <laughs> Joe, Davis, Joe Davis. Because right? we were just talking about Joe Davis. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm sitting here talking with John Noltner, a, a photographer, a peace activist, and author of four books, including the most recent book, Lessons on the Road to Peace. And we were talking about, you know, Joe Davis, whom I also know, spoken word artist, yeah. and I'll let you continue. Yeah, uh, yeah, I love Joe. We've taught together at, at some uh, spaces, and we've, uh, he's, he's helped with some of my programming and brought some of his music and spoken word to it. But he, Joe always says that we do best what we do most, which is to say we got to practice this stuff, mm -hmm. right? If we're going to have a conversation about race and we've never had a conversation about race, we might stumble a little bit and mess up. But if we try again and if we learn, maybe the next time we'll be better at it. Maybe after 10 times we'll start getting pretty well versed in it. Maybe after 100 times we get, you know, fluent in that language. But I think so often when we run up against an obstacle and it feels difficult or new or, or uncomfortable, mm -hmm. um, we just back away. We're like, ooh, I don't want to do that again. Instead of exercising those muscles and developing those skills and getting better at it. So, like Joe says, we do best what we do most. I mean, we know that's true with shooting a basketball for a free throw, but it's also true with human relationships and the ways that we sort of live together. Yes. You also spoke about exploring the world. Mm -hmm. So now, how does that look for you? Because you have changed the way you live life and the way you travel. Yeah. So can you speak on that? Yeah, that book that you've got, Lessons on the Road to Peace. So that's, that's really a journal of um, a two and a half year trip across the country during the pandemic. Um, I do a lot of public programming. I'll, I'll go to colleges, I'll go to conferences and speak and, and lead workshops. Of course, all of that shut down during the pandemic. Yes. Uh, but we realized we could still tell stories. Mm -hmm. I could still interview new people. And so my wife, Karen, and I, by the way, this was her idea. Um, all right, Karen. <laughs> to, to sell the house. Yes. To buy an RV and hit the road. And so that book is from two and a half years on the road. We drove 93,000 miles across the country, um, really intentionally visiting a lot of our, our tension points, going down to the border to talk about immigration, going to Mississippi to talk about moving Confederate monuments, to Skid Row to talk about housing security, but always looking for people who are trying to find creative solutions to some of these really challenging issues. Either people who were directly impacted by these issues or people who were allies and advocates and working in that space trying to create some sort of positive change. And so the book is really a collection of these stories of the people who we met, uh, as well as some of the journaling of the experience of walking into these places that I was unfamiliar with, being welcomed in, um, learning along the way and, and seeing some new ways about how we can navigate the world. Okay, I love that you did, you're literally on the road. <laughs> on the road, yeah. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was an amazing way to live for a stretch. It mm -hmm. was simple, mm -hmm. right? We were in a van that was 82 square feet. 
So you don't have much, a couple of shirts, a couple of pairs of jeans, um, and just what you need to eat for the next couple of days. Uh, but that simplicity was gorgeous. It let us focus on some of the other more important things. And, um, and again, like I said before, once you see some of those things, you can't unsee them. And so this is just a part of, of who we are and how we move through the world now. Okay. And so in the book, you say that it's not just photos. There's some journaling that you have added in here to go along with the photos. Yeah. To tell the story. Yeah, it includes a lot of the transcripts, you know, portions of the transcripts of the interviews. When I interview people, we usually record an hour-long podcast. Okay. And those are on our website and, mm. uh, and, and anywhere you look for podcasts. Um, and so then I will transcribe that and I'll take a small portion of that and excerpt out of it and that's in the book as well as my own experience. You know, there were some interesting personal lessons to be learned in letting go of things as we sold our house. You yeah. know, the house where we raised our kids yeah. and we had a lot of good friends and it was, it was hard to drive away from that. But we did it because we knew there was something else to see as well. So there were a lot of... and. and at the same time, as we were on the road, I tend to fall in love quickly with people and places. And so we would sink into a place for three or four or five weeks, mm -hmm. really uh, begin to love that place and the people that we came across. And then we had to say goodbye. Yeah. It was time to go to the next thing. And that process of saying hello and saying goodbye was a rhythm that we had to learn and we had to get, get comfortable with. And so there were a lot of uh, essays in the book that talk about that personal journey of letting go, walking into uncomfortable situations, being open to, to listening and learning new things. All right. And you mentioned the website, mm -hmm. a piece of my mind. Is it a piece of my, a piece of my mind dot org. Dot org. Okay. Yeah. And you have an acronym if they don't type out. If they don't want to type in all those <laughs> letters. And by the way, it is P E A C E. When you type yes. in a piece of my mind, that's yes. an important distinction. This is a play on words. If you say I'm going to give someone a piece of my mind, mm -hmm. it's usually not a peaceful thing. Right. Uh, P-I-E-C-E. -E, but when right. you flip that to P-E-A-C-E, -E, I like the play on words. And for me, it's an opportunity to really hear what's on people's hearts. Yes. So if they don't want to type in all the words, it's just the acronym A-P-O-M-M -M dot net. Okay. And the other one is a piece. A piece, P-E-A-C-E, -E -E <laughs> of my mind, <laughs> dot org. Okay. Yeah. And now they will find lessons on the road to peace. Yep. And will they find your other three books that you have? They will find you know? two of the other two three. Of the others? So okay. our, our second book, um, American Stories, is out of print right now. And we're try we don't know if we're going to reprint it okay. or if we're going to deliver it in a different way. But our original book, A Piece of My Mind, mm -hmm. that is all stories from Minnesota, mm -hmm. from our own backyard. It's got a bigger worldview okay. than that because of who the people are that we interviewed. Um, uh, American Stories was our second book, out of print. Uh, Portraits of Peace is our third book. It was produced with Broadleaf Books here in Minneapolis, and it's, it's really more narrative, less visually driven, and it talks mm -hmm. about my story mm -hmm. of encountering difference and challenging my own expectations and the process of making a piece of my mind. Okay. And then this third, nope, fourth one <laughs> that just came out um, this year. And by the way, just won the Minnesota Book Awards. Oh, nice. Congratulations. For, for let's see, Minnesota Book Awards Best General Nonfiction. So okay. we, we're excited about that. Uh, and yeah, those will all be on our website. All right. Is there also information on your website about your book signing? The, the release of there the is if you go to, to the events page mm -hmm. uh, it'll link you to an eventbrite page and you'll have all of the details uh, it's free it's open to everybody but you have to register just so that we know how many folks are going to show up right in the door. Head count. that would be so so much fun you should come yes you know you if, all I, should come. if I can make it I am going to be there seriously I don't see I, I think I'm hosting um, a different event because it's it's always that third week of October. But if I can make it, I'm going to come. I've never been to a book signing before. And I always see it in movies. <laughs> I think it's pretty cool. Super glamorous. <laughs> so I would love would to love come. Would love to see you. <laughs> and it's going to be right here in the SPNN building. Yeah. And, um, and that information will also be on your website That's right. as well. 
If there is one thing that you would like to leave our audience with, what would it be? Hmm. We all like a checklist, right? How do I go out into the world and what do I do to make it better? And I think, I mean, obviously life is more complicated than that, but if I had to boil it down, if I had to boil down my process and the benefits I've seen from that and the ways I've seen it connect people, it would be number one to listen deeply, to be willing to just shut up and hear what somebody else has to say, um, to challenge your own expectations. I mean, every interview I go into, I think it's going to be one thing. And when I pay attention, it turns into this other really beautiful thing. And along the way, I understand that some of the things I expected were true about the world might not necessarily be true. So that willingness to let go of our preconceived notion and challenge those expectations. And the third is to stay at the table. Okay. When things get difficult, and they always will, um, not to walk away. Because when we walk away, the hope of connection walks away with us. But if we can commit to staying at the table and finding a path through uh, and finding some healing in that wound, I think that's, that's where the hope lies for us. Listen right. deeply, challenge your own expectations, and stay at the table. All right. And make human connections And make human when connections possible. along the way. Even if you have the answers. <laughs> Even if you know Even if you know what subway you're stop going. you're getting off on, <laughs> go ahead and talk make to that person next to you. Make the connection anyway. Right on. All right. Well, thank you so much, John, for sitting here and speaking with us today. And a piece, a piece of my mind. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Dot org. Dot yes. org. Recent book, October 24th, will be a book release and a book signing right here at SPNN. Yes. And thank you so much for yeah. being on our show today. Great to talk with you. Thanks for having nice me. Nice talking to you. Take care and be well. Thank you for joining us.